Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see you all. Welcome to anybody who's online signing in. We are glad to have you here worshiping with us today. I got just a few announcements I'd like to bring to your attention. We are having a potluck after service today. 
So all are welcome to that. On top of that, next week is Easter. So what we're going to do, we're not going to have Sunday school. Instead, we're going to have a breakfast, and it's going to be a potluck-style breakfast, so bring something. And we'll, we'll have that probably starting around 9.30ish. Um, that should give us enough time to eat and still get up here for the service. So keep that on your mind that we are doing that. Also, there is the sunrise service that will be at the football field at 7 o'clock is when that starts. So if you would like to be, um, come and be a part of the sunrise service, it's not super, super long, but it, it's, it's kind of a fun thing to do and watch the sunrise and that kind of stuff and get our minds focused around Jesus and his sacrifice. So that's seven o'clock in the morning. Then you can come here and have breakfast afterwards. Um, do I, am I missing anything else? My wife's not here today, so I I don't have my other half that can tell me what I'm... I think that's all the big announcements that I needed to make at this point. Um, So with that being said, if the praise team wants to start making their way forward, um, will you please stand and we'll open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this great day to come together and, and worship you to bring our attention around you, Father, put our hearts, our minds, and our souls, um, focusing on just what you have done for us in your salvation on this Palm Sunday, Father. We just thank you so much. We just ask that our worship today will be a pleasing aroma coming up to you. And Father, we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone, let's worship the Lord in song and in scripture. If you would repeat after me, reading Matthew 18 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Surely the presence of the Lord. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord mighty power and his grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it the world and all who live in it. This is my Father's world and to my destiny all nature sings and around me brings Oh, 
David, Psalms 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. morning. Psalms 18.1. I love you, O Lord, my strength. Okay, let's have the first slide. Get knowledge, get wisdom. Here's, here's some verses from the Bible. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Now those are some big old verses, aren't they? Yeah. Let me see if we can talk about them in a little simpler terms. So, get knowledge, get wisdom. So, what is knowledge? Tell me what knowledge is, anybody? It means that you know about, 
That's what you know. You're right. Knowledge is what you know. Now, your parents either homeschool you or send you off to public school to get all kinds of knowledge. And hopefully, there's a little bit of wisdom with it, but we're not so sure. So, next Next one, wisdom is how you use what you know. God wants us to learn to use what we know. So when we get, when we get knowledge, we get it in little building blocks. Now it's like uh, the first thing you probably learned knowledge is you learned the alphabet, right? So there's a building block of knowledge. You learned your ABCs. But just learning ABCs didn't do too much good. You had to have another building block. You had to know what each of those symbols, the A's, the B's, the C's, meant, what they sounded like, and so there's another building block. And once you knew what they sounded like, then you learned how to sound them out together, right? So you could read them. So there's another building block you have to have. If any of those building blocks is missing, you can't get the next building block. Works the same way with mathematics. Here we go. <clears throat> First, we learn to count. One, two, three, up to 100. And we got kind of, huh? You can count to a thousand. I can't count that long. <laughs> okay, you're right on. Okay, so <coughs> we learn how to count, and then we learn how to put those numbers to, there's a one, there's a two, and a three, so we can go one, two, three, and we know what that means. Yeah, we can go with a four if we add one more. Now, once we know that, we can learn how to add these numbers. Okay, here's one here, and we can add plus two equals three. We got it. Once you learn that building block, then you can learn subtraction. It's real easy. Because if you have your two, you take away one, you've got one. And from when you start to learn that, then you know enough to start learning multiplication. From multiplication, it's easy to learn division. And you have another building block. And then you're set up, you can learn algebra and trigonometry and a whole bunch of different higher math that you can use. Okay, <clears throat> wisdom is much the same way. We get it in little blocks. And the first and most important block we ever get is found in the first verse in this book. Can anyone tell me the first verse in this Genesis book? One, one. Yeah, Genesis 1 1. That is the most important bit of wisdom. If you don't have that, you just aren't going to get anywhere with wisdom. For instance, I've got a book here by a man named John Sanford. This guy is what is called a plant breeder. He developed various kinds of plants that would produce more than the original plants. Now, for about 30 years, the plant breeders tried to use the wisdom from this book to improve the plants. They failed. But when John Sanford and some others used the wisdom from this book, then they started developing plants that produced more and gave more for the world food supply. Now, I never met John Sanford, but I met a man who helped him write this book. Now, another man, let's see, slide. Isn't that a good looking guy? That is Trophim Lysenko. 
Yeah, he's a Russian. He thought he was a scientist. He gained political power as a top scientist for agriculture in Russia. He used the wisdom from this book. And since he could control what all the farmers did in Russia back a little over 50 years ago, he made everybody follow the rules he got from the theories from here. They had crop failures for many years. Over nine million people starved to death because they used the wisdom from this book. If they'd used the wisdom from this book, they wouldn't have had those famines. See, this is where we start. Yes? That must be the bad way from the book. That's the good This is a book by Charles Darwin that tries to tell us that there is that God did not create us. Right, there's a good book here and a bad book here. Okay, let's see another slide. Now, as you get wisdom there, can you see what that is? Huh? Yeah, kind of does look like a turtle the way it is. That is a pair of lungs that were taken out of a person when they died. You see all that black stuff? That person smoked all their life. Now, you don't have to smoke to get the wisdom to know that that's what your lungs could look like. See, there are some things, some knowledge you can gain by looking around and watching what other people do or say or the experiments they do or the things in books. There's some things like you don't need to get out in front of a truck on the freeway to know that's a bad idea. You can look at the dead skunks and the dead raccoons alongside the road and deer and say, hey, it's not a good idea to go across the street without looking. See, there's many ways that we can get wisdom or get, get knowledge. Now, one more slide. This one is Louis Pasteur. Of course, because I'm a veterinarian, I think this is the smartest scientist that ever lived. Because he did, he came up with the germ theory of disease, as we call it. In other words, he, he found out that diseases can be caused by bacteria and viruses. And he figured out ways to develop vaccine. All was nothing except he started with wisdom here and knowledge from everything he could learn and the experiments he did. And if you can read what he says up there, he says, a bit of science distances one from God, but much science brings him close to him. The more I study nature, the more I stand amazed at the work of the Creator. So as you go through life, you're going to see lots of things where people know a little bit of science, and they think, this is the book they ought to go to. But if they know a lot of science, this is the book they'll go to. OK, you can go with Karen. Good for you. Let's stand as we prepare for communion. And I'd like you to notice in this uh, verse that we're going to repeat, Psalm 103.11. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. The scripture says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, to go along with what Dick gave us.
all right I can, I can we can we can just pray okay Lord I just thank you for the time that we can come and share in uh, your communion to share with each other what we, you did for us we've got these emblems here on the table one represents the shed blood of Christ and the broken bread represents your broken body. And I just thank you that uh, it's a remembrance. It's to remind us from week to week what you've done for us. It's just a reminder, Lord, and we thank you that you gave us that command. And now as we partake of this emblem, let us examine our hearts and examine our relationship to you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Borrowed, they're not mine at all. Just holding up his hand to brighten my life. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Show brought me from and where I could have been. Remember, I'm human and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Nothing good have I done to deserve God's own Son. I'm not worthy of the scars in his hand. Yet he chose the road to Calvary to die in my stead. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Roll back the curtains of memory now and then. me from and where I could have been. Remember, I'm human and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear
Good morning. All right, before we get started today, just a quick reminder, we've been going through the book of Exodus, but because it's Palm Sunday and next Sunday is Easter, we're going to take a break from Exodus for the time being, and we're going to focus on what Palm Sunday and Easter is all about. So with that being said, this story from our daily bread tells how as believers in Jesus Christ, we are engaged in spiritual warfare with the unseen wicked forces. To overcome our enemy in the power of the Holy Spirit, we must rem remain resolute in our confidence in God and determine never to accept defeat. A story from the Korean War illustrates this attitude. As enemy's forces advanced, Baker Company was cut off from the rest of their unit. For several hour, hours, no word was heard, even though headquarters repeatedly tried to communicate with the missing troops. Finally, a faint signal was received. Straining to hear, the corpsman asked, Baker Company, do you read me? This is Baker Company, came the reply. What is your situation? asked the corpsman. The enemy is to the east of us. The enemy is to the west of us. The enemy is to the north of us. The enemy is to the south of us. Then after a brief pause, the sergeant from Baker Company said with determination, the enemy is not going to get away from us now. Although they were surrounded and outnumbered, he was thinking of victory, not defeat. The reason I chose to tell you this story is because it perfectly points us to the fact that, that we need to be a people who are focused more on the victory we have in Christ instead of letting our attention focus on defeat. However, with that being said, it's very important that we come to understand that finding true victory in Christ is found when we embrace Jesus as the king he reveals himself to be. So with that being said, and because today's Palm Sunday, I'd like to just dive into some of the New Testament texts, specifically the time in which Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem a week before he was taken and crucified. Now, of course, this moment in Jesus' life isn't his most victorious moment because a week later he will go on to perform the greatest victorious moment in all of history by destroying sin and death for all humanity. However, Jesus' triumphant and victorious entry is also such an important moment for the world as well. This was the moment in which all eyes were on Jesus. This was the moment when Jesus was finally revealed and recognized as the Messiah and the King by the people. The crowd shouted for him as their King and they gave him glory and praised him as the Messiah, the anointed one of God. This moment is so important because it, it signified the start of all the events that would lead to the ultimate victory Jesus would have. So he would take our place, he would suffer, in order to deliver us out of the hands of sin and death. Now, if you haven't all turned already, will you turn to Luke chapter 19? We'll be starting off in verse 28, in which we'll learn that we need to embrace Jesus as the king he reveals himself to be. Starting in verse 28, it says, After he had said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he approached Bethpage and Bethany, near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, go into the village ahead of you. There, as you enter, you will find a colt tied on with no, which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are untying it, you shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent, went away, and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus, and they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. 
As he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. Now, if we stop right there, we have a little bit of important information that needs to be unpacked in which we will come to learn that the first key point that we can take away regarding the type of king Jesus is, is that as the king, Jesus comes in peace. Previously, if we jump all the way back to verses 11 through 27, what took place right before I read that, we come to see that the disciples had been wondering if the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. In which Jesus takes a moment to teach them by using parables. Afterwards, we learn in verses 28 through 29 that, that Jesus is going up to the city of Jerusalem. As he makes his way, he comes near the two towns, Beth, Bethphage and Bethany, which were located near the base of the Mount of Olivet. Here, Jesus stops and sends two of his disciples in order to receive a colt that has never been sat on or, or broken in yet. Of course, there is the worry that the owner would think the disciples are just stealing this colt. So Jesus tells them what they need to say in order to put the owner's mind at ease. If we focus on the phrase, the Lord has need of it, we can learn quite a lot regarding the authority Jesus has as king. Kings during this time, they, they had the right to take and use property of the citizens however they saw fit. Because the property was the king's in the first place as the ruling leader. Now, I know this concept is a little weird for us today, especially as Americans, because we don't live under a king as our ruler. The closest we could have would be the president, but really, he's not anywhere close to having the authority that a king would have. So I thought of an idea. If we were to just look at, you know, all the good action movies especially the ones that deal with police officers as the main character. You know those scenes in the movie when the officer pulls out his badge and says, I need to commandeer your vehicle. So he can continue the chase. That's kind of very similar to what Jesus is doing here. He's the king and he has need of something, so he takes it. But he plans on bringing it back. That's the difference in the way he's the king. He doesn't just take and take. He's using something and it will be returned. Continuing on. The purpose for obtaining the cult is really important though. That we, we have to just stop and, and, and focus on this. See, Jesus needs the donkey so that he can fulfill the prophecy that was in Zechariah 9.9. Which states, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the um, full of a donkey. See, Jesus is fulfilling a specific prophecy in order to display to the world what type of king he came to be. See, there are only two ways a king can enter a city. One way wasn't not good at all for the people. If a king came to the city riding on a horse, well, he was declaring something very important. If he was riding on a horse, he was declaring to the city and to the people that war, judgment, and destruction were coming with him. However, if a king would come before the city riding on a donkey, he was declaring peace. Peace. He was declaring that good things were coming. By doing this, the king was showing that he was not coming to punish or judge, but instead he was coming with prosperity and peace for the people. You see, through Jesus' actions, he displayed for us that as king, Jesus comes in peace. And Jesus' mission is to bring peace through salvation. As it says in Zechariah 9.9, he is just and endowed with salvation we then learn in verses 36 through 37 of Luke that Jesus enters the city coming from the Mount of Olivet. Now, the mount, this mountain, it was to the east side of Jerusalem in which the eastern gate of the city would have been facing that mountain. 
this was a pretty big mountain. It was about 300 feet taller than the, the temple proper, which was the highest point in Jerusalem. The reason it's so important for Jesus to be entering from this direction is because he is fulfilling yet another prophecy given to us by Ezekiel in chapter 43, verses 1 and 2, which says, Then he led me to the gate, the gate facing towards the east, and behold, the glory of God, the God of Israel was coming from the way of the east, and his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his, gl with his glory. See, these verses show us how the Messiah was going to be coming from the east and enter the city of Jerusalem through its east gate. And that's exactly what we see Jesus doing. Jesus is the glory of God that Ezekiel said would come. And we see him descending the mountain, declaring his arrival and declaring that he is the king that comes with peace. Can you just imagine that moment in time? What peace Jesus provided for the world and his disciples in that moment? Stephen Davey once told how Don Moen was awakened in the middle of the night by a phone call from his mother-in-law. A tragic car accident had just occurred. Don's sister-in-law, Susan, her husband, and their four little boys were on an automobile automobile trip when tragedy struck. They all were seriously injured, and their eight-year-old son was dying from his injuries. As Don and his wife grieved and, and poured out their hearts to the Lord, they felt helpless to communicate any hope to Susan and Craig. Don recalls asking the Lord to help him express hope to the family members. In a very short time, Don scribbled some lyrics and composed the music for a chorus that to this day gives believers a deep sense of hope in the midst of difficult times. The lyrics read, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. He will make a way. To put it simply, the only way to have hope is to have him. The only way to have peace is to have him. In a similar but even more profound way, as Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, he was providing a way of peace between us and God. Jesus was descending as the king, and because of where the mountain was located, everyone within the city would have been able to see him coming in all of his glory. Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. And as the king, Jesus comes in peace. And by doing this, Jesus became the way to peace between us and our heavenly father. Jesus is the only way. However, Jesus is not just coming in peace. Continuing the story, it picks back up in verse 38. But in order to get the full context of what's being said, let's actually jump back to about verse 37. It says, as soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these became silent, the stones will cry out. See, the second point that we can learn today is that Jesus is the king of heaven. But in order to help us understand this truth, we first need to look at the difference between earthly rulers and the way Jesus rules. Let's just take, for example, our election process here in America. Just look at all the chaos that comes from it. Especially when looking at the actions coming from our leaders or our future leaders. It's become quite ridiculous. I mean, just look at the debates. The chaos that is created due to the, the statements that are given, the constant lying and deceit that is poured out from both sides. From what I can see, there just seems to be a lot of hate a lot of lusting over power, and an extreme amount of deceit. But it's 
not just our country that struggles with this. Every country that has a worldly ruler falls prey to these sinful and lustful desires. Because we as humans are still struggling with the temptation of sin, and we often give in to the lies and the promises to get power. All throughout history, we have sadly seen many rulers fall victim to the enemy, and because of that, many people have in fact suffered because of it. However, with Jesus, we see the opposite. Jesus just doesn't act like other rulers. He's not simply an earthly king. He's also the king of heaven. Jesus does not create chaos by telling lies, by by hating others, or even desiring more power. He doesn't need more power. He's it. He's God. Instead, he brings order and peace out of the chaos. Because Jesus is, in fact, God. Jesus is the Messiah who's fully man and fully God, completely without sin, and the only one who can truly rule with perfection. We read in verse 38 that the crowd shouts, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The first half of this verse is a direct quote from Psalms 118, 26, which was one of the many psalms that was directly sung in anticipation of the coming Messiah by the Jews as they would travel to Jerusalem to um, celebrate the Passover. This psalm was to serve as a reminder for all of the promises of salvation that would come through the Messiah. Another interesting point is the fact that the second part of verse 38 also shows up earlier in Luke's book. In Luke 2.14, when Jesus was born, the angel sang glory to God in the highest. Declaring the baby Jesus who was born to Mary is in fact the Messiah. And because he has now come... There is peace and glory in heaven. Michael Deswich once told the story in a sermon that says, did you know that the colonists wanted to make George Washington a king? But he refused. Because George and many of the colonists believed that there was only one king and it was not King George III. On April 22nd, 1774, before the Revolutionary War, a report was sent to King George III of England. And in it, the governor of Boston exclaimed, if you ask an American who is his master, he will tell you, he has none, nor any governor but Jesus Christ. In April 1775, when the British major Um, called the colonists villains and told them, lay down your arms in the name of George, the sovereign king of England. The immediate response was, we recognize no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. This became the battle cry and motto of the Revolutionary War. No king but King Jesus. How many of you learned that in history? They've tried covering that up pretty well, haven't they? In a very similar but more impactful way, the followers of Jesus are recognizing his heavenly authority as king. Jesus alone is our king, and so they give out their battle cry. Because of what Jesus, God's son, came to earth to do, the people are acknowledging that Jesus is the king of heaven, and they are overjoyed. But, but what's really happening in the hearts of the people, we do got to stop and look at that. What type of Messiah do you really think the crowd wanted Jesus to be? You see, Rome was in charge at this time, and the Jewish people hated that. They were conquered by Rome. They wouldn't necessarily say they were conquered, but they were conquered. They wanted a king to come in order to conquer Rome for them. So as they they cried out, they, they most certainly wanted their enemies to hear the great declaration of the Messiah. They wanted and were hoping to see Jesus go to war and be a Messiah who rides in on a horse who will crush his enemies and bring about peace through the death of others. They wanted Jesus to be a different type of Messiah. They wanted him to be something that he was not. And one day Jesus will come back, and it will be with the horse. 
but not during this time. This time, Jesus was on a completely different mission. And Jesus made it perfectly clear that he came to bring peace and salvation. So in verses 39 through 40, we learn a little bit more regarding the heart of the people by the way the Pharisees respond. You see, the Pharisees are completely terrified. They are worried that Rome was going to hear the people and understand their motives behind the de- that declaration. And they were worried that the Romans would take note of that and in response come down and crush them all. The Pharisees knew the intentions of the people and what they were calling for. They were calling for their king. And they feared the repercussions that may follow. So not wanting a riot to happen, which would most certainly cause Rome to get involved, they asked Jesus to silence his disciples. However, Jesus responds by saying that even if the people were to stay silent at this crucial moment in history, If no one was willing to acknowledge the coming of the Messiah, nature itself would cry out praises in order to glorify him as the king and the Messiah. Nothing the Pharisees could do could stop that. The king has arrived. Even nature itself would cry out that he has come. Jesus is the king of heaven. He alone is worthy of praise and acknowledgement. Jesus was not about to change a thing in this moment. Jesus, as the king of heaven and earth, must be praised. And we must embrace Jesus as the king he reveals himself to be, not the king we want him to be. Here, Luke is deliberately showing us how Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, who is the heavenly king who comes offering peace and salvation, has arrived. There's no stopping it. Continuing on, we learn one final aspect regarding Jesus and the type of king he is. Picking up in verse 41, it says, When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children with you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. See, the final key point for today is Jesus is a king who mourns deeply. Now the type of weeping that we're talking about isn't just like if I were to smash my toe and a little tear comes out of my eye. No, instead, we're talking about a completely brokenhearted, full of sorrow and mourning. Jesus is just heartbroken. Jesus, in verse 41 and 42, is mourning so deeply for the people that he, he can't contain himself. That's the type of weeping that's taking place here. He weeps bitterly for them because he knows they do not understand the peace he is offering or his purpose as the Messiah. He knows that they they want him to act in a different way. He knows that they want him to be consumed with war and death like they are. When in fact, he, he comes to bring peace and salvation for the people of Jerusalem and in fact, all mankind. The Jewish people just can't see the truth at this time. And deep down in their, their hearts, they are refusing to embrace Jesus. They are failing to see that he is offering true and lasting life. The people have failed to embrace Jesus as the king he reveals himself to be. Instead, they have embraced a lie and they've tried to make Jesus into something else, something they want him to be. How often do we do that? We try to put Jesus in a box, make him what we want him to be. This breaks his heart to the point that he is weeping and mourning over the choices the people have made. We then read in verses 30, 43 through 44 that after Jesus weeps, he then makes a prophecy concerning Jerusalem. Jesus tells 
of Jerusalem's destruction that will take place about 40 years later after his ascension back up into heaven. In 70 AD, history shows us that Jerusalem was utterly destroyed just as Jesus said it would be. It was no small thing in, history, in the history of the Jewish people. It was a complete and utter destruction of the city and the temple and the people who chose to stay within it. They were destroyed as well. Jesus weeps for Jerusalem because he knows what's coming. The people have not yet accepted Jesus. Instead, they have rejected him and, and they have not embraced Jesus as the king he revealed himself to be. And because of that, the Lord will bring punishment to Jerusalem. The city will be overtaken and utterly destroyed. Jesus is a king who mourns deeply. And Jesus still weeps and mourns deeply for his people today that haven't chosen to follow him. He mourns deeply because judgment is coming one day as shown in Revelation. Jesus mourns because he doesn't wish for anyone to face hell. Especially since he has already paid the price to spare us all from that punishment. I like the way James Russell Lowe puts it when he says, Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide. In the strife of truth or falsehood for the good or evil side. But to every man there is open a highway and a low. And every man decides which way his soul should go. The fact is we all have to make a decision with regards to who Jesus is. And whether or not we will embrace him exactly as he has revealed himself to be. Jesus is the king who mourns deeply for those in humanity who still haven't accepted his freely offered gift of salvation. He wants to save you. But he won't force you to accept his help. If you don't want it, you don't have to have it. If you don't want to embrace Jesus as the king he revealed himself to be, he won't force you. So what type of Messiah do you want Jesus to be in your life? Do you want Jesus to be an earthly king who creates chaos, who, who only has his own well-being in mind? Or do you want him to be the king who brings peace, the king of heaven, a king who loves you so much he weeps and mourns deeply with concern for you and your life? Are you willing to embrace Jesus as the king he revealed himself to be? The king who is just, the king who brings peace, the king who is our salvation. Will you accept Jesus? Who went to the cross and died to free each and every one of us from our sins and the chains of death? I encourage you, to not choose to be like the crowd who just couldn't accept the type of Messiah Jesus came to be. Instead, choose to accept Jesus exactly as he is. Jesus is the one and only king of heaven and earth who is perfect, holy, and righteous. Jesus is God, and he is all loving. He is full of grace. And he brings peace and salvation to all who put their faith in him. The question is, are you willing to choose Jesus and embrace him as the king he revealed himself to be? The decision is yours. The question is, what will you choose? Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time to dive into your word, to be reminded of just how important Palm Sunday really is and, and how this was the beginning of your last week, Jesus, that leads right to the cross and our salvation. Father, we praise you. We thank you so much for everything you have given to us. Help us to embrace and accept you for who you have revealed yourself to be. You are our salvation you are our redemption. You are the one who brings us back into relationship with God the Father. 
We love you, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So at this time, the praise team, they're going to start making their way forward. And I'm actually going to be stepping back with Jacob and Leanne because we're going to be having a baptism. Two, to be exact. And here's my offer. If you happen to be here and you have not given your life over to Christ, there's no better time than right now. The water's already there. I'm already going to be in there. I have extra towels in the back. If you're ready to make that decision, you follow me back. Let's get ready. Will you please stand as we sing this song? We're going to sing Cleanse Me, the song Cleanse Me. I don't know if all four verses are up there. Uh, if they're not, turn to 317 in your hymnal. And you'll have the words for the last. So we're going to sing all four verses instead of the two. be seated. Quentin, are you ready? Okay. Yep. No, I didn't want to get it wet. I'll just be loud. Does that pick me up a little bit better? Yes. Okay. All right. So 
So Jacob and Leanne, they have asked me last week if, if they could get baptized this week, especially because they have family here to be able to see it. And I said, sure, we'll make that happen. So I got one question to ask. It's a very simple one. Jacob, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I do. Please kneel down. You guys seem vertically challenged here. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask you the same question too. You can come up with just a little bit further. Leanne, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. I now baptize you in the name of the Father. Take care of trivia. Okay, I think we got a trivia to do. Uh, are you ready for this? Okay, where was Jesus when he sent his disciples to a certain village to fetch the colt? Ah, we got a tough one here. Mount of Olives, or Mount Olives, Mount of Olives, I think. Levi, how come you didn't get that one? Okay. How many disciples did Jesus bend, send to fetch the colt? Two? Two. Good job. And why did Jesus say, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out? Pharisees wanted him to rebuke his disciples, to be quiet. Good job, Zethan. Okay, we got prayer and praises. Does anyone have a prayer request they would like to share? Andy might see if there's anything in the baskets. Okay, any prayer requests this morning? Yeah, Levi. Oh, the helicopter crash? Okay. The uh, Army army helicopters, I think, two of them crashed. So, are there any other prayer requests? Yeah, Pam. Okay. Okay. Pam said pray, uh, praise for her family coming to help and a prayer request for her to get situated in her new home and a request for them to have a safe journey home. Anyone else? Candy? Okay, yeah, those were pretty bad tornadoes. Uh, a lot of people lost everything. So uh, keep them in your prayers and... That's the number one need they have, is prayers, and there's people down there helping them. Any other uh, prayer requests or praises? Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, close with our song here. Um, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this special day today. We thank you for Jacob and Leanne and their decision to follow you in baptism and their uh, commitment to follow you. Uh, we thank you for these praises and uh, the prayer requests. We just uh, know that, Lord, you heard them all, and we heard them, and I pray, Lord, that you would just answer those prayers in one way or another. Please uh, be with those people that have lost everything in the tornadoes and be with the families of those uh, soldiers that lost their lives in the crash. And now, Lord, as we fellowship downstairs after this service, I just uh, ask that you'd be with us, continue to be with us in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Okay, we've been following Hudson for quite a while. He's born very premature, and he's going home tomorrow. That's almost worth the applause, isn't it? <laughs> okay, thank you, and we'll close with uh, this song. Thank you for coming today, and may you be blessed for your commitment.